Hello everyone, it's Hannah Johnson from the BIA here. Welcome everyone to the Synthetic Biology webinar. And we've got three of our members and actually Synthetic Biology Committee members joining us today. This webinar talking about their company updates and also looking ahead to Synbiovita, which is on the 3rd to the 6th of November. We have uh, Dr. Tim Fell, Chief Executive Officer of Synbase, talking about Synbase activities and also um, he is Chairman of the Synthetic Biology Committee, so he'll also give us a few minutes about that. We've also got Hayden Parry, Chief Executive Officer of Oxitec, uh, talking about their activities. <coughs> We've got Dr. Stephen Chambers from Symbiocity talking about um, what Symbiocity are doing and also looking ahead to Symbiobeta um, at their run in the UK TI tradition. Um, just a few things before um, the start. If everyone who's not talking could mute themselves just to prevent any background noise, that would be great. And we'll also be taking all questions at the end. So either hold them up then and I'll unmute everyone. Or if you could just um, chat, you can send it in the chat box, which is on the right-hand side of the screen to me, and I'll read them out at the end. Great. So if we can start, um, I'll, I'll hand over to Tim Fell, um, who will be our first speaker. Thank you very much, Hannah. Good morning to everybody. Um, before I go into the short presentation on synthase that we'll make, um, Hannah asked me just to say a few words about the um, BIA Synthetic Biology Advisory Committee. Um, I, I'm not sure who's on the line. I'm sure many of you are already members of the BIA. Some of you may not be. Um, the BIA, of course, is a, a trade association for its members and working to promote a thriving UK bioscience set. Um, we have several committees as part of that, which are made up of members of the, uh, of the BIA companies. Um, and they have a particular expertise in, in their areas, um, and they come together. And the committee members really work together to help inform and guide the BIA on uh, what policies and what priorities it should be making. Um, so that's really what they do internally for the BIA, but it also gives us a, a very strong voice outside of the BIA. Uh, for instance, um, the Synthetic Biology Committee is relatively new. We, we formed about uh, two, just over two years ago. Uh, we've got about, uh, I think, 15 companies involved now, but many people come along and uh, just with various interests in synthetic biology and don't formally join the committee, just uh, listen in and contribute. Um, what this has enabled us to do is become um, a voice for synthetic biology outside the BIA. So um, some of you may know that there's been a large amount of investment uh, in the UK, some almost 300 million pounds from the government into various research centers. Um, and the SimbiCity uh, Innovation and Knowledge Centre is one of the beneficiaries of that. Um, that was really coordinated from the Synthetic Biology Leadership Council, uh, whose remit is to pump prime the synthetic biology um, commercial activities in the UK. Um, up until we formed this committee, the only representatives from industry were, were one person from GSK, and they, they wanted some some smaller company involvement, so didn't know where to look. Once we formed this, they realized that we, we were sort of the voice of the sector, and I was asked to join that committee. And that's a very important uh, influence that we've been able to bring to bear, certainly in the last few months, where there's been a refreshing of the UK Symbio Roadmap, um, which three years ago came out to international acclaim. Um, and we've been uh, integral part now of, of that refresh pro, um, program, including, um, I must say, uh, contributions from many sectors of the, the community in the UK, because the SPLC has done a good job reaching out. But it's through coordinating ourselves through the um, Synthetic Biology Advisory Committee within the BIA that we really have been able to touch uh, many different areas of uh, policy through the BIA directly and through um, other areas like the SPLC. So if you are interested in um, contributing into this sort of uh, process where we all get together and uh, exchange ideas and generate priorities, 
then please do contact either myself or um, Hannah or Zoe at the BIA and um, we can get you involved. Okay, that's all I wanted to say about the committee. Um, and uh, if I may, I'll go on and say a few, pace, um, a few words about Synthase. Um, we are a four-year-old company which originated in UCL. Um, we still actually operate from their labs there, and we're just shortly moving to the London Bioscience Innovation Centre. Uh, we're really focused on driving biological productivity. Um, I always like to put this slide up, uh, which um, taunt people with, um, do you really know where your bioprocess is? Is it stable, or are you on the edge of uh, a cliff in design space? Like, you know, We've all done those experiments on a Friday afternoon when we always works when we've got the green socks on, but not the red ones. So that kind of indicates that you might be near some sort of design cliff where you just topple over and quite don't understand why. Might work might be fine in the micro world, but if you up it to five thousand, ten thousand liters, that can be very expensive. And one thing that we're trying to advocate in synthase is is the use of design for manufacturing, which is uh, a methodology which is very well known across other industries. And in fact, when you look at manufacturing, uh, a good rule of thumb across many different um, sectors is that 70% of the actual costs of manufacture are determined in the design stage, and only 20% of them in actually what processes you decide to actually manufacture with. So what does that mean for us? Um, sorry, I'm trying to click along here. Um, so in synthase, essentially we enable people to engineer biology, but recognizing that it's very context dependent. What we mean by that is that you have to look at the genetic factors in the context of their environment. Of course, that's what phenotype is, but all too often we optimize the genetics on the lab bench and then we throw them over the wall to scale up without really considering the different process factors at that large scale. Um, we can do that internally at Synthase. We have a, a sort of boundary model where we will help people optimize their, their organisms. But we've developed software tools which we now want to help um, disseminate to other people so that they can gain the benefits that we do on their own infrastructure. So we work with partners to basically improve their productivity, not by just doing it ourselves, but also helping them to do it themselves as well. Um, increasing productivity can mean all sorts of things to different people. It can be increasing your throughput and yields, compressing your timelines, or just building a more robust bioprocess. And that's what we help people with. Um, there are three key elements to what Synthase does. Um, one of them is to work in, a, as I say, a, a multi-dimensional space so we can address both genetic factors and process factors at the same time. And this means doing lots of simultaneous experiments. Many people do use multifactorial methods, but often just for process factors at the end of the day when they're actually trying to work out manufacturing. And they may only look at a handful of time, temperature, pressure, three, four, five, we now have pushed the envelope to be on 30 factors and genetic factors at the same time. Now that has taken a lot of automation to be able to do those complex experiments. And it's also meant that we've had to develop an unambiguous language to describe the biological protocols and workflows that we um, use. And we call this language ANFA. Um, we think this is an important uh, uh, development because up until now, we only have English in which to describe biological protocols. Um, and you, know, you can go to the nature section, of the, you know, the, uh, the method section of a nature paper and uh, you know, read phrases like shake vigorously. And you know, we wonder why we've got such a lack of reproducibility in the biosciences. With ANTHA, you're able to code in your protocols into a reproducible, transferable, an interoperable piece of software which will execute down onto the actual laboratory equipment that you want to use. So that's what we do essentially at uh, Synthase. They're the three critical components. Just give you a little bit of an idea of what that means in practice. Um, 
Here's some data from an experiment where we looked at 15 different factors at the same time, some of them process, some of them genetic. And each corner of uh, these two squares, they, they, they model design space, one where we've got a, a medium plasmic copy number, one where we've got high. And what this data is really telling you is that there, around the middle yield, there's about six points which are all about the same. And on the left-hand far top corner, you see we've got some very high yield there. When we get time, temperature, and plasmid copy number right, and they, they, these are interacting factors. What it also tells you is if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, you can accidentally get the wrong mix and get zero. Now, that's where you might be at, at cliff in design space and not know just how close to the edge you are. Now, that's 15 factors. If we go on to the next slide, um, this is a piece of work that we've been doing with a pharmaceutical company where we looked at 27 factors all at the same time, and four came through as strongly interacting. Time and temperature are often uh, two that you see. But code and optimization and uh, strategy in our Vibes and Biden site um, were important factors as well. And what I'd like to point out here is, once again, you get different design spaces. But if you look at the bottom right corner, you see you can get very high yields there. Um, but the, the trouble is, it's on a bit of a slope. Perhaps it would be better to go to the top, uh, top right. And you see there, that you, at the back, you've got high yields, and it's flat across temperature. So what that would mean is that you could lock in your genetic factors um, at the design stage, high ribosome binding site strength and um, codon optimization strategy one, in order to give you um, robust temperature profile, which you may need when you're up in a 10, 20,000 litre reactor. And it's hard to control the temperature right across that. That is designed for manufacture in action using genetic factors. And that's what Synthase has um, been pioneering with its partners. I mentioned AMFA. This is the high level language for biology, which makes it easy to uh, rapidly compose these reproducible workflows and sort of what we call AMFA elements. And um, what that enables you to do is to form workflows. Um, workflows which, once you've actually codified, optimized and codified a protocol, you can drag and drop them into workflows. You know they're going to work, and you can wire in the physical inputs and the information inputs and map the physical and information outputs into the next um, unit operations. Uh, this is how we've operated in Synthase. We've got tremendous productivity uh, over the last few years doing that, and we're now disseminating that into organizations who want to partner with us. So this is some indication of what's been going on over the last four years. We, we approached this, um, seeing that everyone was doing experimentation one factor at a time, fixing everything, just changing one variable. But you miss all of the interactions. Um, when we first started, we were doing things by hand with our 15-factor experiments, but then we had to automate. We had to develop the ANTA language, and it compiles down to the automated execution, and it's completely transformed our ability to do bioengineering. So in summary, our purpose is to try and develop universal bioscience productivity. Um, we have a deceptively simple bioprogramming language, ANTA, and uh, we think it's the, the missing link. Um, we say it's like a pollen's flower. Um, uh, that's the name behind Anther, which uh, is an analogy to effortlessly spreading biological information in a repeatable way, easily linking the lab equipment, protocols, processes, and people. And by linking everything, Anther allows fast and speedy optimization, enhancing productivity for any bioscience and pure research, all the way through to volume manufacturing. So that's what I wanted to say uh, on Synthase. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, at the end, when everyone else has had a chance to speak, I'd be very happy to take questions. Great. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, we'll now be passing over to Hayden Parry. Um, to you, Hayden. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you. 
Okay, excellent. Um, well, good morning, everybody. Um, a little snapshot of Oxitec in, in the next few minutes. Uh, we're a company that was formed out of Oxford University originally um, in 2002. We have pioneered the use of genetic engineering in um, insects to tackle insects that both spread disease and that damage crops. We're the only company of our type in the world, so if you see anything in the press about genetic engineering um, in insects that's uh, actually being used as opposed to thought about, then it's us. Um, so we've gone through um, a life cycle a little bit like most uh, pharmaceutical biotech. You create your company, you develop proof of concept. We've had some nice accolades on the way, on the way from people like the World Economic Forum or Gates. Um, we started going into open fields with our mosquitoes, which is the way we're leading um, our product development. Um, first in, in 2010, we've now got to the point where we have got national approval in Brazil. So we, that means we can actually uh, release our mosquitoes anywhere in Brazil, national biosafety approval. We're actually waiting for the, the sort of commercial label to come uh, next. Um, but we're actually actively doing projects in Brazil now, and um, we have a company there, and we have um, a factory, which I'll show you a bit later on. So that's where we currently stand. Um, we were acquired recently by um, a US group called Intrexon. Um, so we're acquired for 160 million, um, and that completed in um, September. So we're very new into the Intrexon family. So moving forward, um, in terms of what we actually do, our, our very first target is a disease called dengue fever, which is spread um, exclusively by mosquitoes, and indeed almost predominantly by one species called Aedes aegypti. Uh, dengue is the most uh, important virus spread by mosquitoes, although sadly there are other challenges coming up. Uh, one of those is something called chikungunya, which went from literally no cases at all in the Caribbean up to over a million in just one calendar year. So big threat caused by mosquitoes in, in the developed world as well as the developing world. Um, and our approach to that is, um, is a very simple one actually. When male and female mosquitoes get together, they produce a lot of offspring, up to 100 eggs at a time, which hatch out but we release Oxitec males that contain uh, what we call a self-limiting gene. And the effect of that means that the offspring die. So we send out a male. The reason we do that is males don't bite. They mate with the females in the field, in the town. Um, the female will then produce offspring. The offspring will die. We'll release another batch of males. They'll go out, find females, and so forth. So actually, you can achieve a very good results in a town in a very short space of time. Um, much more effective than insecticides, where in a modern society, a lot of people are, have, I mean, aren't in their homes during the day. The authorities can't get access. People have got air conditioning, double glazing. And homes and private property are an incredible uh, breeding ground for mosquitoes. Up to half of the mosquitoes in a town will be uh, living in, inside your home. Um, the benefits of using this approach is, um, is targeting. Uh, humans are pretty bad at finding mosquitoes, but a male will always find a female. Um, the, all of our insects actually contain a marker gene as well as the self-limiting gene, which means that we can do a track and trace. We can actually see where our mosquitoes have gone we can actually easily estimate the population. We can see the effect we're having as we go through the weeks in a town. And a nice feature of this is you are using local employment. Uh, you're not shipping chemicals from Switzerland over to a country. You're actually employing local people to um, develop a local solution. Uh, obviously, it's up, the, the technology is deployed by us, but you're very, it's very much a sort of partnership type approach. Um, it's very safe. We, uh, we only release it, releasing the male mosquitoes. The genetic change we've made effectively blocks reproduction. It's not toxic or allergenic. It's species specific. If you're coming over with a chemical, you're probably um, 
kill a lot of non-target insects that just happen to be in the way of the spray or the fog. But this is a very much a species specific. You don't have those off-target effects. And another nice feature of this is that the insects we release die. Their progeny die. Um, so nothing persists in the environment over time. Um, so to give you a feeling for the results of this, in every field trial we've done or every project we've done, um, we've had over 90% suppression of the, of the mosquito in the town uh, within six months. Um, and in effect, the, the, the more mosquitoes you have, the more you release. It's a numbers game. So we're very confident that providing you have the capacity, um, you can actually achieve similar results um, at a very large scale. Um, and then we've now actually released more than 100 million ox Oxtech mosquitoes, obviously with no adverse events or any issues. Uh, to give you a feeling for comparison, if you're doing this in a town and you're using Oxtech mosquitoes, you're going to expect over 90% reduction in that vector population. If you're doing the same with chemicals, the best result we've ever seen um, is probably around 30%. And that's primarily due to two factors. One is insect resistance, insecticide resistance in the insects themselves. The other one is um, you just can't get access to private property. Um, so this is a, a paradigm shift, really, in, in the way in which we can control insects. Just to give you a feeling of what it looks like, here's our factory in the, on the top left. Bottom left, we have males and females in cages. They produce eggs. We put them in these trays. We've got a much better system for this um, being produced now. Um, but this is the original production system. Those trays, they mature into pupae. We separate them. We put the pupae into these pots on the, on the bottom right. You may just think, how on earth do they breed these mosquitoes if they are all got this self-limiting gene, and the answer is if you put an antidote in the water, um, then you turn the self-limiting gene off. So in a production environment, you can grow as many as you like, but in the wild, um, they're non-reproductive. Non and then you take these pots, you put them in um, these sort of trays, you put, load the trays into the Oxitec van down on the bottom left, and you have an operator mm -hmm. Um, who's got a little GPS, an iPad with a GPS linked um, uh, system. So every time you go past a release point, the iPad uh, makes a signal and you pour one of the pots out of the window. And we've got a rather useful um, use of a Dyson fan there, um, blowing the mosquitoes out. And so the bottom right is just a, gra a sort of graphical illustration of what you're trying to do is obviously get coverage of your area. Um, so actually very simple in practice, and the fact that we have this fluorescent protein in the mosquito larvae means we can estimate the background population, we can look at the change in the number of um, sort of non-fertile, uh, well, sorry, non-surviving larvae versus survivors um, over time, so we can actually get a very clear fix on how we're doing. And if you... Um, not releasing enough in one area, you'll see your percentages of non-fluorescent to fluorescent larvae will, will be different from the rest of the town, so you know that in that area next week you need to release more. Um, so very effective. Uh, we're now scaling up in Brazil, actually. We're um, just putting our heads together to build a very large factory, scale up in process, so it's all around scale now, bringing that forward. As well as going to scale, what we're now doing is broadening out into different markets. Um, we've obviously pioneered this in uh, mosquitoes. We're now going into um, agriculture, high value fruit, vegetables, um, broad acre crops like corn and soya, um, and animal health, so insects that affect animal production. The key thing within Oxitec is focus. Um, there are so many insects, there's so much demand, um, there are so many challenges that you've really got to be very focused in how you approach it. So principally within the mosquito world, we've pioneered this ourselves all the way down to distribution um, where we've created our entire supply chain and indeed to a certain extent contributed to the regulatory system. 
Um, with the other areas, um, we're tending much to work much more with uh, with partners, with the big agriculture companies, or with um, government uh, departments of agriculture and so forth. So I hope that gives you a snapshot. Um, thank you very much, and I'm very happy to take questions later on. Great, thanks, Hayden. Um, we will now be moving on to um, Stephen Chambers from in BioCity. So I'll hand over to you, Stephen. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you um, for letting me uh, come and talk to you this morning. Um, I'm very privileged to be able to follow Synthase and Oxitec in, um, um, in my presentation because they are exemplars of uh, you know, the very best in synthetic biology. Um, two small companies that are making um, a very big impact in, uh, in the world. Um, so I'm just going to give you an update on SymbiCity. Um, if you don't know about SymbiCity, uh, SymbiCity is the IKC, the Innovation and Knowledge Center for Synthetic Biology. Um, it was set up by the government. Um, Tim alluded to the investment that government has put, as the UK government has put into synthetic biology over the past few years. It's around about 150 million, uh, just over four years, has been put into the establishment of six new synthetic biology research centers around the UK. At the same time they did that, they also put in place SymbiCity, which is, its role is to ensure the commercialization or to assist the commercialization of the research outputs from those research centers. Um, it's thought of as an, an IKC is like a nucleating center. Um, typically there are other IKCs uh, with other sciences. Um, and again, typically IKCs are involved in a very early stage uh, technology. Um, we are a consortium of 18 universities and well over 50 industrial partners. And those industrial partners are uh, predominantly SMEs and startups. Maybe about uh, 10 to 15 of them are multinationals. But the bulk of them and the, and the portion that's growing most rapidly are startups. So again, our mission is like we're a national resource of interacting partners from academia, industry, and business brought together to accelerate commercialization of synthetic biology. Um, apologies for the shift in, my, uh, in the text here, but we've got four main roles, translation and commercialization, business support, training, um, skills and training, uh, particularly around entrepreneurship, and also uh, network and uh, um, acting as um, outreach uh, to all the stakeholders, um, especially um, highlighting the need for responsible innovation with all our partners. Our role, as we see it and as it's defined in our mission, is very much bridging the gap between basic research and industrialization. Um, the way we term it is that uh, the research outputs coming out of the research centers typically are technology readiness two, three, around there. And our role is to increase the technology readiness that, of these projects that are coming out of universities. So filling in that gap, de-risking to a certain extent the technology uh, with proof of concept funding and also development of prototype funding as well. So we have uh, instruments that we can use to facilitate this, uh, the translation. Okay, and the principal one as I alluded to before is proof of concept funding. So we can fund projects uh, around a proof of concept where we're trying to validate the science and uh, also we have collaborative funding that we can use uh, to validate the investment. So there's two pockets of money that we can use and you can apply to us um, and um, you fill in a, like we have a, a, an ongoing call for these proof of concepts and development of prototype. You can apply to us uh, either as a partner or even if you're not a partner, you can still apply to us for these, these fundings and uh, they're reviewed, uh, there's a blind review that goes on, and um, the ones that score sufficiently high will be funded. And uh, also the ones that don't get funded, we also make every attempt to go back and see if we can help them get the, uh, the grant proposal in a shape that it will be funded. So that's an ongoing process that we have. Okay, we're acutely aware that you know just providing money isn't going to solve any problems. Um, like I have a movie here, which I don't think is going to work on this format, but um, we also have um, a foundry that we've put in place. We were um, fortunate enough to get a grant from uh, the funders 
um, that allowed us to uh, invest in a considerable amount of automation and analytical equipment. So um, just fairly recently, we've taken our final delivery of our automated platform. So we now have the space and the equipment uh, to start running our foundry. So the foundry, we're going to run it as a cloud laboratory uh, principally. So that means if you've got um, work or designs that you would like to execute on, um, you, they can be sent to the foundry and we can execute on them. Um, the typical way that that will be, let me just go back. Okay, so the way, I just lost track of my slides here, okay. So, um, so the foundry is, is open to all our partners. Um, it has um, um, a platform for assembly and also for verification and analysis. Um, and we're hoping to work very closely with Sintes in, uh, and also embracing the Anthra technology. So again, that would be something that we would use within the foundry to uh, promote and accelerate synthetic biology. But again, we realize that you know, money and the facilities, again, that's, that's not enough. And the other thing that we're very much concentrating on is the commercialization side of things. Uh, no point um, having these great ideas if we can't get them into the marketplace. So what we have is we have something called the Lean Launchpad for Synthetic Biology that we've basically taken out of Silicon Valley, taken it over to the UK and adapted it for Synthetic Biology. So we run this in tandem with all our other programs as well. So this is where um, teams and companies join us and they have an idea and they want to go out and they find out whether there are any customers. So it's a customer discovery process and that's built into um, uh, agile development and also customer validation. Uh, and the way I've set this up, I've set this up in parallel so you'll see like there's a commercialization and also an invention. So as we're doing the scientific discovery and the, you know, looking for the medical breakthroughs and the, the, the invention progression is occurring with proof of concept and developing a prototype, at the same time we have the customer discovery and the customer validation going on in parallel. Uh, in reality, they're slightly out of shift. So we normally do the, co the commercialization very early on in the invention. So that once the lean launch pads, people, teams that have gone through the lean launch pad typically apply for a proof of concept and the development of prototype money. Um, just want to say something about the lean launch pad for synthetic biology because we're constantly recruiting for this. So we're always looking for teams. Uh, that want to join us uh, on the uh, Lean Launchpad for Synthetic Biology. So I have an open call constantly for looking for teams that will join us on the Lean Launchpad. And we run it twice a year and it's, it's very successful. Um, we are trying to roll that uh, program out throughout the UK to other institutions and other uh, incubators and accelerators. Um, and we've got a program that's running in November so again, I would encourage people to look into that if they want to do the Lean Launchpad in their own institution. So what I've been trying to describe to you is um, a series of programs that we have in place. And I haven't touched upon them all. Um, like we have an ideation program, the Lean Launchpad that I referred to, a foundry. We do business support in the form of project management. We have funding. We also have a network of collaborators. Um, uh, industrial partners that can help you commercialize your work. So what we, the way we view it is we have this accelerator program that is available to all our partners throughout the UK who can join us uh, if they want to commercialize their research. The other thing I wanted to talk about was the UK TI trade mission to San Francisco. Um, I think Tim talked about it at the beginning, but um, we're, again, we're very privileged to be able to take 15 of the leading uh, synthetic biology companies to San Francisco in November, early November. And this is a great opportunity for um, our partners in synthetic biology to get in front of um, both a number of investors and also a community, which is probably the largest concentration of synthetic biology companies um, in, the, in the world. Um, so this is a great opportunity that we see for UK companies to go to San Francisco, um, talk about their technology, talk about their vision of what they want to create with their, with their products and services and tools. Um, so we're very proud to be able uh, to be involved in this with the UKTI. The other thing, like if you have 
anything has kind of piqued your interest, I want to direct you to our website. Uh, we've recently put up a, a new website which details everything I've described and, and a lot more. Uh, it will all show, um, identify you know, who we work with, who our partners are, both academic and industrial partners. And we're always looking for more people to join us um, uh, in, uh, in Simbi City and become our partners. And uh, we've got an open door policy. Um, you know, we're here to help um, companies that are involved in synthetic biology or who want to use synthetic biology or just have an interest in synthetic biology. So I would uh, welcome uh, all of you to come and join us. Okay. Again, um, these are the emails. If you want to contact myself or John Collins, um, you know, we'd look forward to hearing from you. Okay, thank you very much. Great, again, thank you very much, Stephen. And okay. um, we'll now be going on to any questions. So we're just going to unmute everyone and see who has any questions. Anyone got any questions? I know uh, that. I know that it's Julie Freeman's questions. Hannah, um, yeah. it, it's, it's Tim Fell here. Um, I, I've got a question for, for Hayden, actually, because I've, okay. I've not had the chance to have a proper chat with him since um, his, uh, his acquisition. Um, Hayden, what does this really mean for your um, other uh, opportunities, which um, you know, you talk about uh, focus. You've demonstrated an amazing technology with uh, has a such a profound effect. People must be beating a door, uh, a part of your door now for your agricultural applications. Um, how are you going to now develop those, bring those to market, and what sort of time frames are we looking at? Okay. Well, the the interesting thing about Intrexon is, um, I mean, they bought us because they saw a very useful technology um, and hopefully a useful team. But they basically said to us, we are staggered as to how far you've got and what you've done on so little money, you know, typical British <laughs> enterprise. Um, and they said, we just want to really accelerate with what you're doing and we can help you accelerate through contacts, we can help you accelerate through uh, technology and we can help you accelerate through uh, resources as well, just physical cash. So the challenge we now have um, is rather different from what we had before. It's really trying to, ch it's trying, it's the, trying to uh, broaden out and fight on a broader front um, with many more resources um, and capabilities, but still maintain a focus so that the management and the staff don't go mad um, with too many things. Um, so the, the challenge really is very much uh, go faster, get on with it, what are your, what are your restrictions, um, let's get rid, let's, let's change them. Um, so what it means is uh, more people, more resources um, and more impetus. Uh, it's quite exciting, quite exciting and it's quite daunting at the same time. So I've got a question um, on the chat for, for Sin uh, by City. Um, how are you finding the general reaction to the term synthetic biology in commercial commercialization at the moment? Is there a noticeable negativity from investors or end users? Um, I, I would say no. Um, um, like I have um, uh, definitely not seeing any negativity from investors. So um, uh, I think uh, end users, if you're talking about customers, uh, people that will actually use uh, these products, again, I don't see a lot of negativity if you can explain the benefit uh, to them of what, um, you know, you're, you're doing. Um, I think, you know, Oxitex is a great example of that. Um, you know, the benefits of uh, the, that, uh, that that technology provides in terms of, uh, you know, saving people's lives, um, you know, saving crops, like I think it's, uh, you know, it's demonstrative. Uh, so I think so long as you can describe the benefits to people, I, I don't see any negativity at all. Um, there is a, um, uh, like I'm from the US, uh, and there is a kind of UK-European kind of difference between the US and the, uh, and the UK on this. So there is, uh, in, the, um, in the US, there's, um, I think there's a greater tolerance, uh, a greater understanding of the commercial benefits and uh, 
you know, the impact that they will have. Um, there is uh, a slight negativity uh, in the UK and in Europe, I'd say. Thanks, Stephen. Um, we have one um, for Oxitech now on the chat, um, asking about their lessons um, from working with the Brazilian government to get regulatory approval for environmental re release and how they anticipate moving forward with other countries. Okay, so in Brazil, um, they have actually quite an enlightened regulatory um, system. Um, and I think they've had the benefit of um, coming late um, into that, so they divide something that's really quite logical. So the way they do it is they have um, they've taken the um, synthetic biology or the, the genetic technologies and they've put it through a central committee, which is um, the Central Biosafety Committee. They so what happens is is your technology gets evaluated on human and environmental safety, whether it's a vaccine, whether it's a GM crop, whether it's a GM insect, or whether it's um, you microbe, whatever it happens to be, you get uh, assessed by experts within a biosafety uh, framework. And then having done that, um, then that is then done. This product is safe and it can be used. Then it gets passed across to Ministry of Agriculture or Ministry of Health or so forth to establish the rules of commercialization. But it does mean that you, it's, you have an ability to scale up, do projects, get field data, um, having had that safety approval. So we think that the Brazilian system is extremely good, um, actually from that point of view. Um, Brazil, from our point of view, in dengue, they are the number one country in terms of being afflicted with dengue and, and taking an active interest. Someone like India will have more dengue, but they don't have the same resource level to try and tackle it. So we've been very pleased with working with um, Brazil. Other countries have got different systems. Um, in the US, for example, we're deemed to be um, a health product, so we go through the, the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, uh, much more complex. They run a coordinated framework and involve all the other agencies. But it's been much slower. Um, and, but you know, they're important because what the FDA sit, do and um, think will be um, formative from, and directional for other, for other regulators. So in a nutshell, uh, Brazil, superb, really impressed. US, it's, it's difficult, it's a long road, but it'll be worth it in the end. And we're also working in other countries um, like Panama, various countries around the Caribbean where, quite honestly, the disease burden is so high that people are pushed um, to consider new options. Um, but there is a general sort of weaker regulatory framework and therefore you actually have to go the extra mile um, helping them set up their own framework so they meet the same standards that we would expect to see in a big country like a Brazil or, or a US. Thanks Hayden. Um, are there any other questions from um, anyone phoned in on the computer? I know Zoe Freeman has one so I'll pass over to Zoe quickly. Um, and this one's for Tim, actually. Um, so with Alpha uh, as a uh, programming language for biology, obviously the benefits can be increased productivity and precision, re reproducibility of experiments. But um, key to that will be getting widespread uptake and use of Alpha. Can you talk about your approach with that? Yes, thanks, Zoe. <clears throat> um, well, Alpha is an open source language, uh, and it's an we haven't entirely started from scratch, we're building on the shoulders of giants because um, it's an extension to a language called Google Go. Um, and we uh, haven't been so arrogant to think that you know, we know all the primitives that have to be added to that language in, in order to extend it to capture the biological domain. Um, hence, it is, um, it is open source. Um, you can see it at uh, Antha dash lang.org and it's up on GitHub and it's open for, for contributions. Um, so we believe it does have to have this open source uh, component in order to, um, the, to, to propagate. Um, as I say, it is a language which actually compiles down to execution and uh, bi biology is about moving small amounts of liquid around a lot of the time. So the thing we focused on 
first and foremost is um, making sure that we have um, interoperability with uh, liquid handle index and in particular the, the new lower cost ones um, decks such as uh, have been provided by SciBio and, and Gilson. Um, the, the way that this works is that um, we're not actually asking device manufacturers to, to change the way they control their machines. We're writing drivers, which um, yeah, very much like when we use our word processors, we, we, we don't care if we've got an HP or a Canon printer, we just send it to it and there's a driver that translates it into the operating instructions for that particular machine. So we're writing those device drivers at the moment. Um, we're going to make them freely available and then people will be able to well, one of the first protocols we're releasing is, is contract assembly. Um, they'll be able to use these, um, these ANSA workflows, hopefully on their own, own devices. And uh, the idea, as you say, is to, is to build critical mass so that um, if, if the researcher develops a protocol um, and they had a Gilson, uh, it would equally work on somebody else's machine tomorrow on a bio instrument. It is early days and uh, we're looking to engage with the academic and the um, commercial users to try and um, get this out there and uh, in fact for those of you who will be attending uh, Symbio Beta uh, in the next 10 days or so, we're running a workshop with SciBio to, to demonstrate uh, how this works in practice and we'll be doing gene assembly protocol in one of the workshops. So if you're over there, please do come along and have a look. Great, thanks very much, Tim. Um, I think that's probably all the time we have with questions. But if you do, if anyone has any additional questions, please email them to me and I will direct them to the right person. Um, just before we close, just some of our upcoming events in the calendar. So we have a CEO dinner and breakfast in Manchester next month, and then we have our bioprocess conference at the end of November. Um, January is um, our legendary gala dinner. So book tickets if you haven't already as they'll be sold out soon um, and obviously February is our Members Day and Committee Summit so put that in the diary if you're a member. Uh, finally I'd just like to say uh, thank you to the speakers um, for participating today, it's been a really interesting webinar and thank you for joining us. Um, thanks. We'll be sending um, the recording round to everyone um, by email in the next couple of days so look out for that. So thank you and uh, goodbye.